Yo, what's up, y'all? This is Fat Man Scoop, the other smooth voice of the club, the two-time Grammy Award winner. Let me make this official for you. Fat Man Scoop, Cork McClan, Internets. It's time to go with my dude, Premium Pete. Let's get focused. Let's go. Internets, let's turn up one time. Premium Pete. Come on, everybody get set. Let's go. It's the next episode. It's the Premium Pete Show. News, interviews, all of the info. Listen up. It's the Premium Pete Show. If you want the scoop in the low, down low, listen to the show. Show cause milk said so. Fuck what you heard, better act like you know. It's the premium Pete show. Internet, I'm not gonna even go through. Uh, uh, we're gonna leave that whole uh, introduction in that we're just talking about headphones. <laughs> Sitting here, uh, I mean, this has been a long time coming. That's first of all, because I was like, sometimes when I go through, you know, doing the podcast uh, game for so long, you're like, damn man, there's certain people uh, I I should have sat down with already. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, how the fuck did this not happen? So I reach out to the one and only Jeff Staple. I'm like, listen. Jeff, got to come on. And he's like, what's the name of the show? I'm like, fucking Premium Pete Show. What the fuck are you talking about? Now, I don't expect everyone to know everything I'm doing. I know Jeff, you know, we know each other yeah. uh, uh, for a while. And I know he knows about the Combat Jack show and, 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 and what that was doing uh, in this space early on. But, um, yeah, listen, we sat down with so many people. Like, before we even got on air, we started kicking it about, you know, uh, uh, Ronnie, and we'll get into him, and Yu Ming, and, yeah. and all different people just from all different walks, walks of life. And now that even, first of all, uh, uh, we could call you so many things. Uh, you know, you definitely got to call you even an entrepreneur. Okay, you know, I'll take it. Uh, a podcaster now. Yes, look at this. Look at this. Now you a rookie, this. a rookie podcaster. Uh, well, it's, you still listen. You, you podcast. <laughs> I, I, there's no resume, man. There's no. You know, it's like right. there's no like. Oh, I went to school for this. Yeah, yeah. Like you exactly. didn't go to school for broadcasting, right? And no. I don't even want to jump all around. But anyway, listen, internet's. Uh, designer, uh, fucking uh, collaborator, fucking sneaker uh, lover. I'm not gonna say sneakerhead. Um, I'm not a fan of the word sneakerhead. I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe. Everyone born before like 1980 doesn't like the word sneakerhead. I don't know, man. Sneaker fiend, sneaker, sneaker lover, sneaker connoisseur, sneaker, sneaker connoisseur. There I mean, so go. many things. The one only Jeff Staple. Jeff, welcome to the Thanks show. Thanks for having me, man. Thank you. Um, first of all, how do you like podcasting? You're doing podcasting now. I'm addicted. with Hype Beast. Yes, Hype Beast it's Radio. Called the, it's called my show is called the Business of Hype. Okay, I yeah. I, I listened to a couple. Uh, Sean Weatherspoon. Yeah. Um, uh, who else was on there? Uh, Jerry Lorenzo. Jerry Lorenzo. Yeah. It, 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 there was a lot of people in the business, and I like that because it's like what you're doing is, uh, you know, some there's many different podcasts, mm-hmm. and some podcasts are really helpful for other people. Mm-hmm. And and I that's what I I've come to like Combat Jack show I feel like was very informative. Uh, it, it it broke molds as yeah. being long form content uh, in the hip hop space and a lot of space. Absolutely. When I moved over and did my own show, I wanted to give people something like I didn't want like yo listen to me, listen to me, mm-hmm. and I, that's what I hear when I listen to you is like thank you. Like uh, uh, people could learn something from it. Yeah, people yeah. could you know because sometimes you look like Jerry Lorenzo, people say like fear of God, mm-hmm. and they're like oh my God, like you know that dude. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. But yeah. meanwhile, he may say like look, I didn't even want to do a brand. I'm not mm-hmm. saying he said that, but I'm just saying like the, the people realize like yo. People breathe and people go through these struggles. Yeah, and and, and but they still create. So, yeah. So hats off for uh, doing your own podcast, man. Thank you, man. And I wanted to just create a show where, like, you know, it, it it allowed people who wanted to follow their dreams and do their own thing, but beyond that, learn about real hardships and real facts that people went through, like debt and taking out loans and sure. hiring people, like sure. these things. You know, most people don't talk about because it's uncomfortable. But I think because I'm a peer of them and not a journalist. Like they feel like you know the walls are sort of taking down. And sure, you just sure, talk sure. Freely. Yeah, and that, and that's the most important thing. I always I always tell people that too. When when you know when it's friendly and and, and you're able to sit down and talk. It, yeah, those, those are the best conversations. We were just talking right now before we got on the air about doing an interview with someone you know versus like a complete somebody stranger. you don't know. Yeah, yeah, it's a little bit different. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, because you know what it is too. It's like it, 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 it you don't know a lot about them. You have to do research. It's a different type of communication. Yeah, like me and you. It, like like look. You know, we were kicking it about five minutes before we even got on air. Right. So it's like that's smooth. That's a conversation right there. But if I didn't know you, it'd be like, you know, I'd be on my phone, yeah, all yeah. uncomfortable. Like, all and right, shit. Uh, all right, what do we got going on here? <laughs> but look, for people who don't know you, Jeff Staple, born in were you born in New York City? I was born in Jersey. Okay, really? Yeah. Where in Jersey? Monmouth County. Monmouth County. How <laughs> yeah. was that for people listening? Uh, you know, who may not even know what the fuck Monmouth County is. How was that growing it's up? A, it's only forty-five minutes outside of New York City, but it's another universe. You know, like you go 45 minutes outside of New York sure. and it's like suburbia. Sure. Um, and it was, a, I mean, I don't know any other way to say it, but it was a predominantly Caucasian community. Mm-hmm. You know, I, very small amount of minorities. Like I went to a high school of 
1,600 kids, and there was three Asians. Mm. Like, can you imagine those? There was like five black guys, you know? Um, so it was very, like, much where racism was just an everyday thing. Sure, me, sure. You know, just, and it's not like hateful burning crosses on your front lawn, but just like ridicule every day. It was just normal. It wasn't until I went to NYU that I was like, wow, racism isn't something that. Is a, it just happens to you every day. Like someone just doesn't call racial slur every single day to you. You know, did sneakers? You know, did sneakers like diffuse any of that? Because the reason why I say that for is when I was growing up, uh, the first time I ever seen the Jordan Three, and this mm-hmm. is you know early on. You know, that's my I'm, shoe. I'm gonna yep. be 44. That's the shoe for me too. Um, um, I'm 44 it? too. 70, really? I was born in 75. Me too. Okay. Fuck. Yeah. December. March seventeenth. All right. So so <laughs> so. Uh, but it's interesting because the Jordan three was the one for me too. So yeah. What's your Jordan three? So story? so the, I was in science class, uh, Mr. Silverstein, <laughs> and and uh, I'll never forget. He he had that white coat on, uh-huh. and uh, he walked in, and right behind him uh, uh, was a new kid in class, Asian kid. Okay. And he walked in with the fucking black cement Jordan threes. Oh, not you. You no, didn't not have me. One. No, you saw no, them he, on a yeah, kid. Yeah, and an Asian kid. And I remember I was like, "Holy fuck! What are those? Wow!" And and and, and it's just just the elephant print and and, yeah. and and the bubble and the and the jump man and 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 listen to me, man. Uh, first of all, back then, if you had Jordans on, right, you weren't only about it, but you, if you were able to keep them on your feet, mm-hmm. you were about it. And and. and, and <laughs> I always felt like like there was kids there that like you know the reason why I say diffuse it is like okay people make it funny maybe they're making Asian jokes or mm-hmm. bothering you or or harassing being racial yeah but then also maybe if you came in and or you had these certain sneakers they're like oh people no, were like no it was worse yeah it was worse Fuck. think about it if you're in suburbia everything is ass backwards the True. fashion the trends so I was ridiculed for my style like I'd be wearing these stuff. what is that weird gay shit mm. you got on your feet I'm like. They're Jordan 3s. Like, it wasn't props to wear those shoes. In fact, it was only we, me and one other kid. His name was Darren Hudson. I'll never forget. We would battle on sneakers. And it was the only, we were only two kids that were into shoes. And I have a very similar story. It was instead of science class, it was social studies class. Mr. Olson. I mm. never forget. Shout out to Mr. Olson. Yeah. Walked in. It's so funny that you say that story because it's an Asian kid too. But I got the Jordan 3s. Walk, and I came into class like about five minutes late. Walk in. So everyone's sitting in a rate already and then they look at me because I walked in late and then they look down at my feet and everyone's jaw like dropped mm. like including Mr. Olson like I snapped 30 necks and like when that you know that feeling of like everyone just like what that was like oh shit I'm hooked, I'm I, mi- hooked. I, I miss I miss that feeling man I miss like that that I remember when it I still see, ha- I, it still happens man you yeah. walk down Broadway with some heat and you see that guy that like just you know, you could feel his eyes daggering onto your shoes. Yeah, yeah, I sure. still like that feeling. I, I even like you see like even like us if we see like an older guy or even the younger kids who see like older guys. They're like, I see like I'll give you an example like uh, um, I live in Jersey now. I live like you know well, okay. not not mountain. I live further <laughs> out. And uh, the Wawas is fucking yeah. phenomenal. Shout out and, Wawas yeah. is dope. And I'll just <laughs> I, I'll get out and I'm like uh, fill it up because you can't fill your gas up with it. So I'm like fill it up regular. And they're like I see you with the Jordan 11s and 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 I'm like you know they're like you know looking fresh. And I was like thank you my man. I'm like I see Ultra Boost. How you feel? Comfortable? <laughs> and it's like amazing. And Word. I always use this example of how sneakers. Uh, 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 or icebreaker, yeah. 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 I'm, I'm gonna give you an example. You know how uh, people wear like the 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 like um, the reflective black uh, with the yellow. It's like a black and yellow. Like when they're doing the gas, a lot of people have like oh a yeah, vest it's like on. a safety thing. Yes, yeah, yeah right. So uh, this kid, he came up to the car, and I was like, fill it up, uh, fill it up like a uh, regular. Mm-hmm. And he looked mad, and I was like, what the fuck's this guy all mad about, whatever. And then I got out the car because mm-hmm. I wanted to throw some stuff in the garbage, and I seen he was wearing electrolyte foam posits. Okay. And he came back my way, and I was like. I see you, my man, crushing it with that outfit. Let your iPhone pause and the fucking vest. Man, they don't even know what you do. He's like, man. And he literally Brightened just, up, yeah, right? he was like, oh, man, they don't know what I'm doing. I'm crushing. I'm like, yes, you are. And 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 he was like, you know, like, then he was like, yo, you need anything else? Like, right. His whole attitude changed. Yeah, yeah. That's what I miss about sneakers, uh, where sometimes people, like, judge, like, what they're wearing instead of how they're wearing it. Mm-hmm. You understand, when we grew up, don't get me wrong, Jordans and all these things were, were powerful, but the way people put together an outfit too, it wasn't like it only had to be like designer stuff. Yeah, it was like does it, you know do you look fresh? Right, you know? and you would have to make it yourself. Sure, you couldn't sure. look at a blog or a magazine mm-hmm. and copy it. You know, like I remember my favorite thing to do was going to VIMs, mm-hmm. Vims, yeah, Vims, right on Broadway, and like going to the the bottom rack yeah, was yeah, always yeah. the markdown. Yeah, and finding that like that gem that was so ugly that it became dope again. 
You know, and like I'd wear that thing. People like, yo, where'd you get those? Vim discount <laughs> rack. <laughs> Find it now. You know, like I got the last pair. That's the shit I love doing. Did you ever think on? Now we'll get into your uh, uh, career and your journey. But did you ever think an Asian kid uh, who was being made fun of? Mm -hmm. I grew up in Jersey. That uh, would literally, uh, you know, work with Nike. Uh, not only there's so many others we'll get to of how many people yeah. you fucking worked with, but you know, did you ever think? Did you ever never, think? Yeah, never. Mind even when it was dreams. going on, did you? Did you, you understand? Did you like, take a break to think about that shit. Every day, I, I, I'm. It's a blessing, man. Like you know, when you grow up as a sneakerhead, like Beaverton, Oregon, where yeah. Nike's headquarters, sure, sure. it's the Wizard of Oz. Mm -hmm. Like you don't go to Beaverton, Oregon. You know what I mean? And the fact that like they invite me out and like I've had meetings there now and then like that already just going there is a dream come true. You know. Besides making the shoe, putting my logo on a shoe, that's another ridiculous dream come true. Even if I, if I made a shoe and the shoe tanked and it was ranked as the worst shoe of all time, I'd be like, that's cool. I made a shoe with Nike. Fuck sure, you. Sure, sure. Yeah, exactly. But then the fact that it is in the position that it's at as like sort of like a holy grail of the culture. Sure. like. Dude, you could kill me now, and I'd be so happy. I'd be fine. So let's give people who, who people who listen who know you, they'll, you know, they'll, they'll get a chance to know a little bit more about you. But people who don't know of you, let's give people. So Staple, Jeff Staple, is that, yeah. is that your real name? No. So where the fuck did Staple come from? The first dude who bought Staple in a store, who was the manager of the Triple Five Soul Store in the Lower okay, East wow, Side, wow, yeah. he named me Jeff Staple. Is that on Lafayette? Uh, yeah, on Lafayette. Yep. Really? Yeah. Where is this guy? I, Deflon, where are you? Man. I've been looking for you, Deflon. Want, Jeff wants to take you out to eat, man. He's like, yo, you, yo, what up, Jeff Staple? And I'm like, yo, don't don't call me Jeff Staple. That's not my name. He's like, what? You're Jeff and you do Staple. I'm like, yeah, but, you know, like Mark Echo was big at the time. Sure, sure. And I was like, I, I kind of don't want to be like Mark Echo and like, you know, Jeff Staple. No disrespect. I love Mark. Sure, He's my of mentor. Course, of course. But um, I didn't want to do the same thing. And he was like, nah, you're Jeff Staple. And then like, He's just a funny guy, and he just made it catch. Okay, and then another <laughs> an, an, another another uh, amazing thing is you then take a pigeon. Yeah, that becomes you know becomes literally like the mascot, the mascot of your life. Yeah, how the fuck did that happen? I mean, I've always been a fan of Mark Echo and what he did with the rhino, and you know. Ralph, of course, with the polo horse and Lacoste with the alligator. And I just always thought animals as logos is like really powerful. Um, and I've always had a had like a sort of a compassion for pigeons. Like they're most people think they're gross and they're vermin and they're rats, but I always felt like, man, to me a pigeon is like a New Yorker. Like it's just out here trying to survive just like us. It shouldn't be here, just like we shouldn't be sure, here. Sure. But it's living out here. And it's gotten to the point where it's such an authority that like we move out of the way for pigeons. Like you know what I mean? Like they pigeon, don't they New don't York fly. pigeons especially. New York they just pigeons, stand there yeah. and like you have to walk around a pigeon. And yeah. I love that attitude. New York pigeons are thorough. <laughs> Yes. Uh, so, you know, I just adapted it. And then, f trust me, for the first five years, people were like, why you got like a street, like a rat with wings as your logo? That shit is whack, you know? Were you able to like uh, copyright a pigeon? Like, yep. Yeah, really? Yo, not only See, was I, I able never to copyright even, yeah. a pigeon, yeah. I copyrighted pigeon shit. What? So I have oh, a. That's right, you have the splatter, right? I have a U.S. Patent Trademark Office document that's got pigeon shit on the middle of it. That's fucking It's funny. fucking dope. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what about even the colors? Like a lot of yeah. your colors have been like a gray and an orange. Yep. Sometimes I feel like you've gone with the gray and the pink, I think. Thank right? you. I like that you're so observant on this shit. Uh, well, well it, listen. It, it, we, it, we go from like an orange to a pink to an infrared, yeah. Yeah. Because Why? pigeon feet. Like, okay. are those different colors, different hues? So we go with different ones. And um, yeah, the color, unfortunately, is not trademark. It's really hard to trademark a sure. color. Yeah, sure. But I like that the streets trademark it for us. So anytime a sneaker brand or a company comes out with a shoe that looks sort of like our pigeon, you read in the comments, yo, I hope Jeff Staple got a check for this one. You know, like yeah, they just yeah, say it for sure. me. So it's great. Yeah, I remember the hat. The hat. Who did you do the hat with where it had the shit stain on the back? New Era. New Era. Yeah. yeah. Shouts to New Era. So listen, before we actually take it back to a younger uh, uh, Jeff, let's stay on where we are. So y y you, you think about it. You get Jeff Staple, the name. Pigeon is the logo or the yep. mascot. Yep. Uh, you know, how the fuck, the, take us to, uh, what exact day was, uh, well, I, I, before that, how the fuck did the <laughs> staple Nike SB Pigeon oh, dunk, you know, how did that even, like, come about? Was well, that, the talks even, like, you know? Yeah, I mean, it was, we were already working with Nike at the time. Okay. So we've done design projects with Nike, never a collaboration. When you say we, was it? Staple design. Okay. Yeah, me and three other guys. Okay. 
Um, so we already had a relationship, and I, the way I met them is another great story because it involves Rob Stone, the Fader magazine, yeah, yeah. and all this yep. shit, which we can get into later. But um, so our, it's not like we didn't know each other. So Nike called me and said it's it's a big anniversary year for the Dunk. I think it was the 35th anniversary of the Dunk, which at the time was like my favorite shoe. The Dunk and the Air Force One are the two most iconic styles from Nike, and they said we want to do a Dunk that's dedicated to New York, and would you like to work on that shoe? And it was a phone call. I'll never forget that fucking phone call. I hung up, fucking did a cartwheel, and I was like, hell yeah, we're going to do this. You know. So uh, at the time, we were already working on the Pigeon. And so you know, we, had, we explored some other ideas, but at the end, we decided to make the shoe look like the entire thing into a Pigeon. What was their response when you sent back the image of uh, the artwork? <laughs> <laughs> they didn't understand it at all. But kudos to Nike, they trust their collaborators. Mm -hmm. Nike does the, the legwork in picking who they work with. After they choose who they work with, it's pretty much you get to you get to run the show. Sure. You know? So if you look at like I'll give like everyone knows the Virgil thing right now, right? Sure. Off white. Yeah, and, and the ten collection that he yep. did. They took the time to identify Virgil. Now whatever Virgil did is amazing. Now it's amazing, but you could I could imagine two years before they did that, people were probably like, "You want to slice up the shoe, cut up the swoosh? You want to sew our stitch on backwards like crazy shit?" They're pro thinking in their head like, "This is crazy." But yeah. yo, we picked Virgil. We're gonna trust them, and look what happened. Yeah, Nike. You're right because Nike was very tight too for a while, where it's like, you know, oh, we don't do that, or we don't do this, or they were very yeah strict. Yeah, strict. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's to, especially to legacy stuff. Like you're gonna cut our logo. You're gonna, but why are you gonna put logo on it? We already right. know it's our logo. Right. Right. You know. And so, if you um actually, if you listen, no plug, but if you yeah, listen to my close. Jerry Lorenzo episode of Business of Hype, he talks about his collaboration experience with Nike and how they initially were like do an Air Force One and just color it up. And he pushed back and he's like, you got the wrong guy. Like, Fear of God is not about just color ups, you know? Sure. And you could see he created all new silhouettes. So it's dope on both parts that like, they're able to really collaborate like that. Sure, shouts to Jerry Lorenzo. Word. So, so, so how long was that whole process uh, when you sent them back the artwork till they approved it? Three years. Okay. Wow. 2002 was the phone call. Okay, okay, it's 2005, you're right, was the release. Yeah, 2005 was the release, Fuck. man. Yeah. Uh, so so how many <laughs> pairs did they make? They made 150 pairs. And uh, at that time, did they pay you for that? Meaning, like, did you make money off the shoes? Or was yeah. it just a... Uh, because, you know, sometimes people would just mm -hmm. get paid uh, like by making... With the shoes. With the shoes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that one, we got a design fee, like a consulting fee, nice. and we got the shoes. Nice. Yeah. Uh, st do you still have a, 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 a stash of pigeons? No, or? I have one. What? Yeah. You know what the great thing about the pigeons is, is like, I'm actually trying to actively buy them back. Mm. Like, I want to bring yeah, the pigeons sure, home. Sure. sure. Every time I meet a kid who's got them, I'm like, yo, how much are you trying to sell these for? He's like, $20,000. I'm mm. like, bet. I'll take them. He's like, no, nah, I'm actually not selling them. Like, really? kids aren't trying to get rid of them for like 15, 20 racks. Fuck. What was the most that it ever went up to? Was that the most? I think 20, yeah. yeah. Now, so bring people again who are listening who may not fully know the story. So 2005 comes. You yep. set a release date. Yes. This is, when that was it? February 22nd, 2005. Yeah, take us through it. Set, set a release date. Had no idea what was happening. Um... And then kids, four days before, started lining up and attaching tents and lawn chairs to the, to the grading of our store, Reed Space, in the Lower East Side. And the line just kept growing and growing. The day before, it was manageable. The line was like maybe 50 people. I come in the morning of, on February 22nd, and there's just hundreds of people. NYPD, SWAT are already on site, blocked the entire city downtown. And they start arresting kids who wouldn't come out of line. But if you were sleeping outside for four days through a blizzard, mind you, and now a cop's telling you get offline, you're not getting off yeah, that sure, line. Yeah, fuck that. So they were arresting these kids. <laughs> and then when cops start pulling people physically off a line, altercations start to happen. And then it and then a riot broke out. Like it really got contentious. It made the newspaper. Yes, it I remember made the seeing... evening news and the newspaper. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What, what was they make the all post? Of them a post. The yeah. post, yeah. and it was just like the first time a Nike ever been on the front page of a newspaper in history. <laughs> did did they ever say anything to you about that? Did they ever say like, we believe you now? Or did they ever say no, what? They were pissed. Okay. The next right. day they bad. were like, it was yeah. bad press because yeah, they, right, they right. incited a riot. But so like, I got a call from Nike NYC and the head was like livid mad, right? Like, how, 
what, what is this orchestration? What'd you do? What is this stunt? I'm like, it's not a stunt. It, like, it really just happened sure. like this, right? And then it's funny because later on, her assistant calls me and she's like, Jeff, I overheard the call. I know she like reamed you out a new asshole, but like actually afterwards, she had me go out and buy as many of those newspapers as possible for her collection. <laughs> so like, she's secretly like super happy. She's gonna send the newspaper to all the executives at Nike, you know. So it's like, I think it's it's bad press that it obviously caused a riot. You know, they, it was a dangerous situation. You know, people brought weapons. Like sure. I, I, after the scene cleared, I saw like knives, baseball bats, everything out there. Um, so it, it could have gotten really violent and dangerous. Luckily, nothing transpired like that but it's it's great for the culture because what happens now is you know 89 year old lady who lives in central park west is like wait what's going on here kids are waiting in line for sneakers you know and like it just blew up the culture at that point i'm sure they were uh, cops too because at that time not everybody was camping it was no no, you know it it wasn't a thing where you would see it like that so so i'm sure cops are like what the fuck is going on oh yeah he was cops the cops were like what are you selling drugs out of here like no we're selling sneakers are drugs in the sneakers like no it's just a sneaker (laughs) because people still think about it too and 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 we're in the world of sneakers for years just grew up loving Loving it, yeah. you know. Obviously, uh, a lot of people to this day. So, like, so you have like three hundred pairs of sneakers in your garage, or like, or whatever you have, or like you have three of those. Like, why? To me, know? the number yeah. is is what's evolving over the years. So, yeah. like five years ago, if you had twenty pairs of sneakers, people looked at you funny. Mm-hmm. Now it's like, even if you have over 50, and I know, you know, there's sneakerheads listening to this and there's non sneakerheads. Sure. So when I say I have 50 pairs of shoes, people are, some people are like, that's fucking crazy. And some people are like, yo, that's a weak ass collection. Yeah, sure. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that number keeps creeping up. I feel like right now, 50 is like the number between normal person and sneakerhead. Yeah, you know, you, you, you know. By the way, I have thirty five hundred. Just okay, <laughs> okay. Yes, that's, that's, that's insane. I, See, yeah. I, I downsized a lot over the years because you know what? You know what I realized? Uh, I was a you're an adult. <laughs> oh, yeah, when I got kids, but but, but 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 having said that, there's a lot of people who have a lot of kicks to have kids. But for me, I'll be honest with you, I got to a point where. I stopped wearing everything. I like the rotation that I- The, rota- uh, the rotation's yeah. like 12. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and, 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 I'm, and, and I'll be honest with you, a lot of comfortability. Adidas came with the Ultra Boost. I, I got addicted to them. Me too. You I know, like, I was wearing I like them for like- pairs I, of I, I couldn't get them off. I mean, I still always wear Jordans where uh, I'm, I'm tons of 11s, 11s, Brad's. Uh, 11s, I, right. I, I'm, I'm addicted to 11s, addicted to 3s, addicted to 4s. And they're and, and they're for me like they're they're legacy. Yeah. And, and and to be honest with you, they're not uncomfortable for me. But when you start wearing like Ultra Boost, you start wearing <laughs> it's another level. Yeah. Even uh, these uh, epic uh, React uh, uh-huh. uh, ones, uh, you know. Yep. T- it, listen, back in the day, and I always say this, I used to go. I remember my mother. You know, I would save half my money at a paper route, and uh, she would pay the rest of the money, and I would get like a Jordan Five. I think it was like a Fire Red Five at the time. They, I think I was wearing like seven and a half or eight at the time. They only had like a, a, a nine or whatever. Mm-hmm. I was like, yeah, that's my size. <laughs> right. I'll so the point I make is either whether it was higher or smaller, where my feet were jammed in there, uh-huh. I got them. Yeah. Because I wanted to have them right there at that moment. Mm-hmm. So I'm, today I'm like, yo, we're in a place where you could be fresh and comfortable. Yeah. That's something that I feel like, <laughs> you know, is is, is yeah. different. And I'm, I, even though I'm an adult too, I will say that what I'm trying to do, and I've never said this on the air publicly anywhere, but like. I'm actually trying to build, like, the, a street culture museum. Museum, yeah. I was just gonna yeah, say like, that. Yeah, like, so I have, I have about 200 pairs in my home, about 12 on rotation, like you, like everyday sure. rotation, and the other 3,000 plus are in an offsite storage facility, fireproof, weatherproof, windproof, and I've got 10,000 vinyl records. I've got 5,000 t-shirts. Fuck you, I've whore got, and I've got you. no, but it's yo, the organization is next level, alphabetized everything, man. I've got Fat Farm tees, Triple Five Soul tees. I've got PMB Nation. I've got vinyl records. I've got comic books. I've got like Amazing Spider-Man number 12. So can we see uh, a museum? Uh? Well, I'm just collecting right now, and I my prediction is that one day the Met or the MoMA is going to realize what this culture means. Sure. And similar to you know, they do hip hop exhibitions sure, now and sure. stuff like that. They just did a sneaker exhibition at the Brooklyn Museum. Sure, sure, yeah. I think there's going to be a street culture museum. That was like, a traveling one they did. Yeah, a yeah. traveling one. But I think there's going to be a street culture one where it's like we want to see vinyl, T-shirt, street culture, sneaker culture. What did this mean? And do you my, know Mike Wapuza? No, you know I- I Mandinos. I don't know if you're. Oh yeah, Mandinos, yeah, 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 of course. Yeah. yeah. So Mike is, has a tremendous oh, uh, uh, vinyl collection. Dope. Tremendous. Yeah, yeah, I mean, they'll call me Clark. Yeah, yeah. Clark, yeah. Forget it. Clark, forget it. Yeah. This is his vinyl collection <laughs> to his sneakers and everything. So let's let's take it back for people yeah. uh, who really don't know you. Um, you grew up in Jersey, mm-hmm. right? Mom and dad. 
Yeah, they grew. Yeah, Chinese. Yeah, what did immigrants. Mom, what, did, what did mom do? They both uh, were, you know, classic Chinese immigrant story, which is like they distributed soy sauce and fortune cookies to like really? local restaurants. Yeah, they had a warehouse. They they brought in fortune cookies from China and found local restaurants to distribute them in. So my childhood was growing up in the warehouse in Chinatown on Franklin Street, which is now fucking the highest price like sure. Tribeca neighborhood. But yeah. back then it was straight yeah, up sure, Chinatown. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I would hang out there. Um, and God bless them. You know, I'm an only child. They weren't really that great at like traditional parenting. Like they had me sitting in a warehouse, like an active warehouse with forklifts and shit. And they'd be like, you know what? Go out, just like walk around and come back at five o'clock. So I'd walk around Broadway, like, you know, 8th Street, St. Mark's Place. That's where you got a chance to learn New York City. Exactly. Yeah. I'm talking, you know, antique boutique, sure, sure. unique, three card Monty. You know, mixtapes out the trunk. Like, I felt that whole vibe, you know what I mean? And then finally stumbling upon stores like Union mm, and Triple Five mm, Soul. Mm. And you, you think about, like, you're a, you're a 13-year-old kid from New Jersey, and you walk into Union, and you start smelling the Nag Champa, and you got the Ken Sport mm. mixtape, and then you got Stash and Futura making subwear, like a little clothing line, you know? And then you walk in, and you feel like the intimidation of walking into that room like yo I don't belong here and you just I'll stand in the corner quiet I'm getting goosebumps saying this I'll stand in the corner quiet and hope nobody notices me while I just like shop real discreetly you know I'll be like um can I try these two on you could try one on okay yeah. I'll try this one on you know yeah. it's like just trying to like yeah, retail, fit in retail especially in street real like that was yo <laughs> su- super thorough man. yeah exactly Union is uh, legendary even Nort Recon man yeah you know? Um, I mean, there's so many spots in the city. It's great that you were able to do that. You know, it's funny you mentioned like fortune cookies. It's like I, I thought that I thought they had you putting the fortunes in. The, in <laughs> no, the no, cookies. they came prepackaged. You know, I, I actually, you know, it's funny. I actually one time uh, I got a fortune on a you know table uh, of four, and we all got the same fucking fortune. I was like, wait, that's that's, <laughs> that's not whack. fucking yeah, that's, that's corny. How you got my fortune? <laughs> but you know, growing up with Chinese immigrant parents, mm-hmm. like, were, were were they like, uh, were you very close to mom and dad? Like, were they very loving like that or huggy or like no or just no like not at just, all it was very strict very yeah. true yeah strict asian parenting and it was like you got to be a doctor or a lawyer you got to go to med school you got you know you need your master's so here you are fucking around with sneakers did they did they believe in no. like okay they were like what the fuck why do you keep spending your money on sneakers you know and the one good thing is that they wouldn't buy them for me so i started working from when i was 12 years old mm. you know 13 i remember my first job was developing i don't know if you remember these photo map booths like before they had digital film you had to bring your film to a one hour yeah photo, one hour photo, yeah, yeah. One hour yeah, photo. Yeah. and sometimes they would have this little shack in a parking lot mm-hmm. and i would just sit in the shack and s- smell fumes and develop film i swept hair Fuck. at a hair salon i did the i worked at a vhs store where like my job was to rewind the tapes for customers that didn't rewind. don't be, quant- don't yeah. be kind <laughs> rewind don't be, be, yeah, kind, rewind. be kind rewind yeah. i was the rewinder I worked at a busboy in a Chinese restaurant, you know, like, and this was for kicks. That's why I would take every paycheck and go to the East Brunswick Mall. They had an athlete's foot, and I would just look at shoes on the wall. I don't know why. I just felt like something, something about the was style. There friends? Was there friends that were also buying that you were, like, influenced by, too? No, I think it was sports. You know, yeah. I was a big Andre Agassi, Bo Jackson, John McEnroe True. fan. Classic. Yeah, and I was just like, yo, these are my warriors, and, like, I want what they have on their feet. And that's where it really started. And then there was a style thing, of course, as well. Um, but my parents were like, I don't understand. You're wasting your money. You're wasting your time. And then when I said, like, you know, I don't know if I want to pursue this career, they, they really took it hard. You know what I mean? You mean being a doctor or? Yeah, or, not being a yeah, doctor yeah, or yeah. being a creator. Yeah, sure, sure, like, sure. What the fuck is a creator? Yeah, exactly. Now, now, when <laughs> when did they believe what you were doing? Because I'm sure, and I'm, I, mean, I'm, I don't like to count anybody's money, but you have done a lot of things over the years, and I'm sure that, and I like to use this word because it's, it's still a big word, but I'm sure you have made... Not only in your pocket, but I'm sure it generates millions or a million dollars, right? I'm sure you made a million dollars, right? Mm-hmm. That's fucking insane to think of, <laughs> right? For for when did your parents believe that? Because every everybody's parents is different. Yes. Sometimes you gotta buy them something, or right. they, or, oh, or they I got the answer. Okay. It it was ten years after I started Staple, so I started Staple in '97. For ten years, they had no idea what I did. Like they knew I made a living, but they didn't know how. Ten years later, I got written up in a tiny little, like, one-eighth of a page article in a Chinese newspaper. <laughs> and then they're like, oh, we so proud. <laughs> I was like, yo, I've been on the cover of, like, Complex Magazine. Like, you know what he t- 
<laughs> but it was like this shitty little newspaper. And then they, they were like. You're in front of Post on the Post. <laughs> You're on the news. Yeah, but you know what it is? It's like Chinese, older Chinese parents, right? They sit at this big table, like of 12 people. And then they talk about their kids, right? So like, and then they go around like, oh, he opened up his second practice. He drives a sure. seven series. Like, oh, he's doing this big court case. And God bless my parents. They just didn't know what to say. Sure. They're like, he makes lots of t-shirts. I do- he made a sneaker. It did really well. And and like, made a sneaker? That's what my uncle did. He, he worked in a sweatshop and made sneakers. So your son's doing that? Like, they can't parse sure. out the difference, you know? And so, but yeah, that Chinese newspaper did it. And now, now my um, my parents are very proud of me. But I even like lost touch with my dad for a long time. Like I didn't talk to him for like seven years because he just thought I was a complete screw up. I went to art school and then I dropped out of art school. Like you went to NYU. I went to NYU first, dropped out. Then I went to Parsons, dropped out to start Staple. Mm. To st- I mean, can you imagine telling your Chinese mom, who like immigrated here to have his her, their first the first ever. Klansmen in history go to an American college to say, I'm dropping out because, oh, what are you dropping out for? You you marrying rich? You hit the lotto? Like, no, to silkscreen T-shirts to sell at local shops like Union and Triple Five Soul. Reed, Reed Space uh, uh, was a very um, creative spot. I remember even like the little knickknacks that were in there, a lot of people who didn't understand the culture that uh-huh. were coming there yeah. were fascinated by it. Yeah, it was one of the first street culture stores yeah. ever. Yeah. You used to have like a lot of classroom chairs in yep, there. Yeah, it was school like themed. Yeah. And because I dropped out of school so many times, you know, like, and I didn't do well, I kind of wanted to say, I wanted to reframe what education means to people. You know, like, you don't have to follow the rules of education to be quote unquote successful. So I modeled my store after a school because my thing was like, you could come here and learn a whole different way. Yeah. You know, and Reed Space, yeah, it was, it was sick. How long was it open for? It just closed down a 13 couple 13 years. What? Yeah. 13 years in the same spot. Finally decided to close it. Um, and then I partnered with uh, Extra Butter and South so Extra Butter. Yep. And so you could, a lot of people, Walk in the extra bed, like, yo, I, f- I literally feel the DNA of Reed Space yeah, in here. Yeah, you know? yeah. So, like, it was great to be able to just partner with operators who know what they're doing. Definitely shout out to the Extra Butter crew. And, like, if you go there now, it's just, like, it's it's the dream of what... I think Reed Space was almost like beta. It was, like, prehistoric. Sure, sure, sure. And then Extra Butter is taking into account what's happened with sneaker culture and street culture today. And it's perfectly representative why, of that. Why did Reed Space have to close down? Was there a reason or just... Um, There was a couple reasons. I mean, there was... uh. Rent finally, you know, after a ten-year lease, yeah, yeah. they kept raising the rent. Yeah. The place needed to be renovated. Uh, my the rent land... is too damn high. Yes, remember that guy? I don't know if you remember. He, he was like, his... <laughs> "Do you remember that? Where, who's that guy's name? Benson." Guy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he used to be like, "The rent is too damn high," <laughs> and it was just it didn't make any sense anymore. Yeah. You know, so yeah. uh, and re- you know what retail's happening now? Yeah, like yeah. it had to be redefined. So it was a good time to reset it. Uh, and I got some ideas in my back pocket for what a, a Reed Space 2.0 might really? look like. Really? Yeah. So be on the lookout. Yes. Okay, okay. Breaking news. Yes. You know what? Let's take a quick break. Sitting here with the legendary Jeff Staple, the guy who grew up in fucking New Jersey, uh, was picked on uh, or, or called racist remarks Yeah. many years ago. And the journey is, is fucking insane. 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 Who the fuck would have known? Be on the uh, the, the post and, and so much more. Internet, we'll be right back. Don't go nowhere. Cheer. It's Ronnie Feig. You over here checking out my man, Premium Pete, on the Premium Pete Show. Internet, and we're back sitting here with my man, my friend, Jeff Staple. Listen, uh, the journeys that we spoke about, mom mm-hmm. and dad, and I love that because a lot of people listen, I'm sure, relate all different ethnicities and cultures who they're supposed to be like a doctor. The parents are like, ah, you're supposed to be this, you're supposed to be this, you're supposed to be this, and then you go and do something. So you think about that. That's a lot of, that's like a trailblazer of, of opening it up to, to say not only, you know, for, for, for yourself, but just for like other Chinese kids yeah. that could be like, yo, oh, any person so have you color. ever had like certain, well, of course. Have you yeah. ever had like certain like especially even like Chinese kids come up to you as as and be inspired by that? Yeah, on an hourly basis, <laughs> it's that, really see, that's beautiful. amazing. Especially yeah. being the kid in Jersey where you only were like three. What did you say? Three Asians were uh, yeah, in the school in the whole school. Yeah, and now it's like you know, and, and of course it's more than just Asian kids mm-hmm. or Chinese kids that are inspired. Yeah, and you've tra- traveled the world. Right, you know, yep. think about it. You know, uh, uh, I just came. I was in Shanghai last week. Okay, yeah. Is is, is that normal to you now? What the uh, just traveling? Like oh that? Yeah, yeah, I'm on constant jet lag mode. Was there okay? We gave a moment where uh, <laughs> success uh, felt like to your mother, yeah, and father. Yep, yep. When did you feel like yo? I I've arrived. Like I belong here. Like always, oh, shit. Like you want to hear something crazy? Yeah. 
every time I see a kid on the street wearing staple, mm -hmm. I feel like I've made it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that happened like, you know, early on in my career. Like every time I saw a kid wearing staple, I get goosebumps. I'm like, whoa, this kid doesn't know who I am. And he just is rocking my shit. That's so Did crazy. you ever go over? Did that feel too weird to buy hey, I only did it yeah. one time. Yeah. I did it How once. How did that conversation go? It was on St. Mark's. It could be a quick it could be a cool conversation. It could be a little douchey. It was the worst. It was the worst. I did a collaboration with Bobito Garcia. Okay, shout right? to Bobby. Yeah. He, we, he had Cucumber a store, slice. He had a store called Footwork. Yeah, yeah. And we did a staple footwork collab. And I saw a kid on St. Mark's place rocking the hoodie that we did. And I was like, oh my God, that's amazing. I went up to him and I was like, yo, that's a dope hoodie. Where'd you get that from? He's like, he turns to me, he's like, didn't you make this? And I was like, oh, fuck. <laughs> like, I totally, like, got yeah, sunned. Yeah, yeah. I was like, He's I'm like, never oh, you're doing reaching. that. <laughs> you're reaching, yeah. boy. <laughs> you know, the way you speak about characters um, in this sneaky yeah. game. Yep. And, uh, you know, we spoke before, or, you know, off air, we were talking about uh, Ronnie. Mm -hmm. and uh, Your past guest, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, it was, it was a tremendous episode. A lot of people loved that He was very unfiltered, opened up. Um, I love him, and I love to see his come up. I've seen so many, you know, different people's come ups. Yeah, and 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 I'm really proud to see you know different people like that. And I remember too, I you know we were talking. I was like, uh, I was telling you, I was like, he has uh, made it his business to show people who uh, he's admired. Uh, love and I remember when he was showing uh, love to you mm. um, many years ago. You know, and yeah. it, kind of like you and him really connecting and yeah, yeah. and building and to see where he has uh, taken it. Even like you Ming, it's astonishing. Yeah, yeah, I remember you Ming said like, "Yo, he even though me and you said you Ming mm -hmm. is a quiet uh, mafia, mafia assassin, uh, yeah. assassin in the sneaker world." You think about it, Ronnie, uh, Ronnie Feig uh, has to be. Uh, uh, a, a tremendous successful story. Yeah, you know. and and you know I, what I love about this culture now is that everyone, like whether it's Heron or Virgil or Jerry or or you know Ronnie or Yu Ming, every, even Kevin from Hypebeast, like everyone sure. has a role in this culture, and there's enough. The beautiful thing is that there's enough bandwidth for all of this role. It's like early days of hip hop, where like you didn't have to choose whether you wanted to be an intellectual MC or a gangster MC. Like you could have both. Sure. They can both exist. And that's what we have now in street culture, which sure. is a beautiful thing. I think, uh, like, there's still some people that are like, oh, fuck him. He's too, like, you know, he's too this or he's too that or he's too quiet or he's too loud. Like, no, they could, we're characters. We can all exist. Sure. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I used to say the the more people hated on him, the more he uh, succeeded. You know, oh, yeah. You know. Feed off that hate, man. Oh, that's oh, what yeah. I do, oh, too. Yeah. It's been great to see you. Shouts to Ronnie. Yeah. You know, um, it, you've done a lot of collabs. Yes. Has been, you know, well, let's start naming some of them so people. Yeah, I mean, know. there's of course there's Nike, there's Fila, Timberland, um, New Era, you know, and then there's non-shoe sports ones too. So like we did a collab with Shake Shack. Yeah, that's right. You know, I remember um, that they did a they did a we did a shake, shake a shirt. Yeah. yeah, it was a pigeon. Yep, right? a pigeon shake. Yeah. <laughs> See, how does something like that happen? They walked in the Reed space and they're like, "Do you want to do a collab?" <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Fuck. Yeah. We we actually rarely go out and like ask people to do collabs. Of course. We, yeah. There's a lot of brands in streetwear today where their whole business is collabs. Like if they didn't have a collaboration, they wouldn't make any money. We actually have like a really strong inline brand, and so collaborations are just cherries on top. You know. Yeah. So we don't go out and like actively try to get collabs. They're just like, if it makes sense, it makes sense. And and again, going back to Ronnie, like shout out to Kith because like. They drop so many collabs that like it's mind boggling how much work that must take and the work ethic that sure, Ronnie has is, sure. is amazing. I'm much more like organic and it's like I have to have dinner with the guy and then like go on a date and if it makes sense we do a collab and then it takes sure, you gotta three feel years. It. You gotta yeah, vibe I'm much other. more about that. And I'm not like, yo, collab, let's do it. Let's, you know, sign these documents, send over the CADs, we'll we'll bang it out, and then here's the release date on Monday, like I can't do it that way. And, and I'm jealous that like other people can. I just don't work in that capacity. But thankfully, I have other streams of revenue that don't make it a necessity to do it that way. The Olympics is next year, right? Yes. You have Japan. anything planned? I know you probably got some up your sleeve, like a collab or anything yes, like that. Yes, we do have some things. See, fuck. I, 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 <laughs> I, You're connecting the dots in my mind right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no but it's in Japan. You okay. know, Japan was the first country outside of the U.S., and New York, actually, outside of New York City, Tokyo was our second region in mm -hmm. 1997. So Japan's always been a, a second home to me. And yeah, it's going to be in the Olympics. Plus, skateboarding is like an event at the Olympics for the first time next year. And, you know, we did the Nike SB. So it's like, start 
tying everything together, yeah. something special might happen. It should be uh, very special. You know, uh, we mentioned, even like when we were talking about Ronnie, we mentioned ASICs, and I remember people were hating, saying, ah, he's just putting different colors on it. Did you get hate for certain things? Like, for instance, I'm trying to think if I remember, but I you did an air walk, right? Yes, I did. Did you get hate for the air walk? Like, did people try to, like, downplay that? Yeah, of course, some people, but no more than anything. Else. Like even when I did a, a Nike this past January, like yeah. I still get hate on that. You know, my it's funny. Like you said, Ronnie's hate is like people thought they just he just colored played on Asics. Like my hate is everyone thinks that I just put pigeons on things and they just like that's my whole business. You know. Yeah, you know it's funny too because would you would you think that would you ever feel like and and, and this is probably something uh, um, that um, Benson could you. Uh... This is probably something that, um, you know, I'm sure you probably feel more than other people, but you ever feel like you don't want to overuse the pigeon? No. Okay. Not at all. That's my fucking logo. No, I know, but do you, <laughs> do you ever think that people could be like that you're, and I'm not saying you are, I'm just asking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, if, I don't. Okay. I wish I could respond, and this is this is my response to every person who's ever written. Like, well, yeah. Right. If you, like, how are you going to tell Ralph Lauren to stop using the polo horse? Like, that's his logo. I think you're what you're missing the point is, and this is probably my fault. I'm you're missing the point that the pigeon is my mascot. It's my logo. Like when I pass this company down to my great grandkids, they will be required to use the pigeon on these goods because that is our logo. You know, um, same with Ralph. So like, I think they they think I'm like. I guess maybe it took Ralph like 20 years to get over the haters too. Have you ever met Ralph? No, I haven't. Uh, is yet now? Has there been a point in time? Because look, you've been around, you traveled the world. You, mm-hmm. you, you, you. When you talk about being a creative that yeah, you are, yeah. you've created a lot of opportunities for yourself. Mm-hmm. Have you ever been in a room with like somebody that you like? Holy fuck, this is crazy. Kanye. Yeah, that was an amazing thing. And, and, I got a great Kanye story. Talk to me about it. Um, so I'm I'm in one of the uh, I've I've a design client and I'm in one of their offices. And the CEO tells, like, waves at me to come in, and I come into the office, and there's a guy sitting across from him, but I can't see who it is because his back's to me. Open the door, he's like, Jeff, have you met Kanye before? Kanye turns around, and he's like, Triple OG in the house, and like gives me a huge dap and a hug, right? And I'm literally like paralyzed. I'm just like, huh? And the CEO is like, what? Because <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, sure, sure. Yo, this is the OG, man. Like, this is Triple OG right here. And I was like, holy shit. He's like, yo, sit down. So we sit, and then like what I thought was going to be like a nice to meet you, I'm out, ended up being like an hour conversation of him just going crazy, ranting. You know, just like he went on his soapbox and just started going off. And he started talking all this money shit and like really detailed stuff that I really felt uncomfortable, like I should probably leave the room. Mm. And it's funny because right when I thought that, Kanye was like, yo, Jeff, you should probably leave the room right now. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was, I was like, that's yeah, what yeah. I was thinking. <laughs> So I, so I get up, I walk out the door, and he's like, yo, Jeff, Jeff, Jeff. And he, he hands me his phone. He's like, yo, put your digits in here, right? So I'm like, my hands are like shaking. I'm like putting in my digits. By the time I got to the elevator, I shit you not, I get a text message. Yo, this is Kanye. It was really a pleasure meeting you today. Mm, mm. I was like, wow. Did you ever connect after that? Like, yeah, we were texting a lot after yeah. that. And then uh, and then he changed his number and threw out his phone, and I never tried to get his number yeah, again. Yeah. <laughs> what about Jay-Z? Uh, no, I never met Jay-Z. Nope. And and nobody ever called like big trying to get a pigeon from the stash. You what know? do you mean? Trying to get a, a pigeon from the stash. Like nobody called like no, big. You no. know how that happens over the years. Like yeah, they try to get a hookup. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, like, but Jay Jay, I've seen pictures of Jay wearing staples, so I don't know how he gets it. But yeah. he doesn't ask us for it. No, yeah, I, I could picture somebody like, damn, we need a staple pigeon. You know, how many you got left? Remember, like I was actually said, you only have one. Yeah, trying yeah, to get yeah. It back. Um, you know, as as you keep on going, how many years has it fucking been? Is 22 it, years. God, 97. fucking damn. Heads don't know, man. Yeah. And even- t- Well, they need to know. Yo, even before the That's 22 years- That's why podcasts years, are cool. I know, but like, heads don't know. Even before the 22 years, there was like, yo, I designed like raucous album covers, you know what I'm yeah. saying? Like, I designed Sound Bombing, Lyricist Lounge, Company Flow, Reflection Eternal, and then before that, Fader Magazine, like the first 20 issues of the Fader Magazine- like this is, this was a special time in New York City. You got you know this like sure. Union Triple Five, of course, and then Raucous and Fader, sure. and like the Roots coming up here to Wetlands, and you know like live and direct throwing parties. Yep. Like this, this is a time that will not occur again in New York City. You're talking the Tunnel. You're talking like classic. You know what I mean? Like and then starting a brand in this era is like yeah, you can start a brand today. But it just, you won't capture New York City in what it was. Well, even lasting that long, 
Hey, think about it. You've oh, yeah, been around yeah. for 22 years, but but even you know the even people how they know Pigeon or Reed Space or Staple. Right. It's a long time. You like you got to give a shout to Nikki Diamond. Um, Absolutely. I mean, 1998. Yeah, you know they're still around. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's like not every brand does that. No, you know? like, I, yeah. my my mission from the beginning, I knew this was a it was a marathon. Yeah, I knew that. Yeah, sure. And this was a game of um, who can hold their breath underwater the longest. And that was my shit. Like I'm just, I don't need to be the flashiest. I don't need to be hanging out with the stars. I don't need to be tossing around money. I will fucking hold my breath underwater longer than anyone else. Well, and that's- you have proven that. And you're still ready, <laughs> but don't fucking die on us. Um, you know, I remember, uh, I don't remember when it was, but remember when American Eagle, I remember you were complaining yes. about something. American Eagle uh-huh. had, uh, what they have in there? Explain it. They had my pigeon dunks in yeah. their store window display. Yeah. And and that, did that upset you? It did a little bit, yeah. yeah. And then yeah. Uh, it, it this is a beautiful story because this just like shows how dope the internet is now. Like, American Eagle acquired or partnered with a reseller um, who has a big name. His name is Urban Necessities. Uh, J.C. Lopez is the owner. Uh, they acquired or partnered with this company, and then in doing that, they were then able to legally, through a loophole, allow to put up like Travis Scott, you know, like sneakers, like DJ Khaled Jordans, and my pigeon dunks in their window display. And I was like, what the fuck? This is American Eagle Outfitters, like a publicly traded $4 billion company that's using other people's intellectual property to promote their brand, mm. unauthorized. Mm. Even just them having Nike is unauthorized. They're not a Nike account, you know? But they found a loophole by investing in a reseller. Okay, so I went to town on Instagram with my feelings. And it was 50-50, because on one side, people were like, yeah, that's the most fucked up thing ever. On the other side, they thought I was criticizing J.C. Lopez and his business tactics. Sure. So I, I, didn't, I honestly didn't know who J.C. was. I reached out to him, and I said, I just want you to know this is all peace. I have no beef with you, and I, I only have beef with the tactics of American Eagle. And then I said, you know what? I have a podcast. Why don't you come on this week, and we'll hash it out in person. That's so gross. yeah, so we just talked and, and it was, and, and it he was came all on? love. He came on along with two legal associates from American <laughs> Eagle to, to make. I was like, who are these two? Oh, they're just here to monitor. They had probably guns on them. Yeah, exactly. But you know, no, now Jeff, you get out of line. We're gonna fucking pop you. I'm so glad that now me and JC are cool and like. But he, isn't that crazy how he, shit happens? You know what? He schooled me. Oh. Like if you listen to that episode, he explained to me like Jeff, the kids are gonna get your shit no matter what. You trying to stop them from getting it in this one store is the same as when the record labels were like, yo, let's shut down Napster. Yeah, you could shut down Napster. They're still going to get it somewhere. And I was like, wow, bro, that's true. Like, if I make something and the kids want it, I I can try to contain it, but they're going to get it no matter what. You know, later on, uh, which is recently, you uh, uh, really released a pigeon yeah, but, but we but we changed the colors, right? Yeah, yeah, I got like, them on my feet right here. Yep. Yeah, so it was like uh, black this, and white. So explain explain how that came about. Okay, now. so this pigeon this is the th- it's the third, technically the fourth pigeon that came out through Nike alone, and this one's modeled after a panda, mm-hmm. and this goes back full circle now to my Chinese days of being a minority in New Jersey. I spent a lot of time in China recently, and now I have this whole new perspective because I'm Asian American, so I'm not Chinese sure. Chinese. And when I go to China, the kids are like, yo, you've been in New York and you've learned all this stuff about the culture. Why don't you bring it back over to the homeland? And like, how come I can't get your stuff in China? You know, so it was always in my head, like, I want to do something to give back to China. So we did this pigeon dunk, which is modeled after a panda, which is the official animal of China. And we released these shoes first in China and then last in New York. And how I many pairs? To, uh, this was a lot more. Okay. I don't like Nike doesn't tell you anymore. Did the they do numbers. Did they do well? Oh, it's ridiculously well. Nice. Yeah, yeah. But it was just dope to be able to give this gift back to the motherland, you know, and like be like, here, you're dropping these first. Uh, and it was the the turnout, like, you know, the family out there just came came out and represented. Like on the first drop we did in Shanghai, like 3,000 people came Fuck. out to the drop. It was like a rock concert, dude. You know, one thing about you that I've always admired over the years is is you've made uh, something we love, sneakers. Uh, you make it look, uh, I don't want to say easy, but you're a professional. Thank you. Um, you know, everybody's different. You know, everybody, some people are more streetwise, some people, like, you're a professional. <laughs> So my question to you with this is, is being somebody who's very serious, you mm-hmm. know, uh, uh, and professional and, and, and has had a lot of success, what what are some things that have, like, you know, uh, you learned over the years that, have, that somebody listening that could be like, 
fuck, man, you know, that maybe you can help somebody. Uh, m- you know, they may have to fall once or twice, yeah. but at least they could learn a little bit. What, what are some of the things that uh, you learned over the years that you say are most valuable? What I learned, f- uh, one of the earliest lessons I learned is they're only going to remember you for the last thing you did. Mm. You know, so you could have this huge legacy. You could do some amazing stuff. And I find that, I find this with a lot of young people that I meet is like they did one dope thing and then they feel like they can just keep like resting on that laurel forever. But you got to keep innovating. You got to keep pushing. And then, you know, Ronnie is a great example of this. Like every time you got to raise the bar again and keep on raising that bar because they're only going to remember you for the last thing, man. It doesn't matter how many amazing things you created, you know? Sure. So that's why that when you say professional, it's almost like, a, a, a gut check for myself. Like, am I stepping it up from the last time? Am I continuing the legacy? Um, so that accountability for yourself is like super key. Yeah. Yeah. You know, how many times have you, you know, a lot of people may not know, but how many times have, was there ever a time where you like, you wanted to like stop doing staple or were you ever a time where there was like issues that, mm-hmm. that you have had that you had to overcome or, cause that's the thing. People like, look at you. Ah, he made, you know, he made the pigeon dunk. He did this. He had read space, but you got to live your life too. Yeah. There's passings probably in your family. Yeah. Things, sacrifices. You know, yeah. But yeah. I'm saying people don't, don't realize like what, what has to go through that. Yeah. I mean, you know, the only time that I ever wanted to stop doing staple was in the fifth year. Mm. And why is that? 22 years in, you know. So the fifth year, every business I hear has like a five year itch where like 90% of startups end in the first five sure. years. And that fifth year, I think it just comes from like you have to invest money into your company to keep it going. And in the fifth year of you investing, like it could run out of gas. And without invest, I didn't have investors, I didn't have any partners. So like it was running out of gas and I actually sat my staff down and I said, I think I'm done. And my staff was like, you can't stop doing this. And I remember one dude was like, you took us out into the ocean, now you gotta get us to the coastline. Like you gotta get us across. And I was like, fuck. <laughs> I was like, all right, fine, I'm back in. you know. But it was, a, it was an interesting time for me. I was letting the stress get to me. Um, I, I had a I had a really close near death experience that sort of like reframed my life, and so like I wanted to stop doing it. But ever since then, it's been like golden. I, I love doing it now. Well, I'm glad that you uh you know listen. There's bumps in the road. I'm glad that you don't yeah. let that fucking get you down. I think I don't know if we went over this, uh, but was there a collab that didn't happen that you wanted to uh that happen that this fell through? Or? There's a lot of collabs that fell through. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of samples. One but... that one that stuck to your heart? No. Yeah. No, because I feel like they're, it was meant to be. I'm very much a, a guy who's like in tune with the universe, if you will, and I like yeah. to let like you know nature take its course or whatever. And it, if it doesn't happen, it didn't happen for a reason. And also, I never close the door. I'm not a bridge burner. Sure. Sure. I've had I've had collaboration projects where like it literally died. Like they we literally sat at a table and we're like, we're not going to make this happen. It's not going to happen. Have a nice day. We left, and two years later, we're working together and doing a collaboration. You know, like I'm not a I'm not a bridge burner. Like I'm always down to to work with someone. How did uh, Oakley uh, collaboration happen? Fuck. I mean, we've been working with Oakley for like a decade. I don't remember how it started, but I've been a fan of Oakley since Jersey days. I've I was I have a collection of Oakleys as well. Um, so I've always been a fan, and I don't know how they originally reached out. Um, I can't remember how. I got to ask Brian. I got to reach out. He's still there. The guy who I started yeah, working with. Yeah. He's still there. I'll, Fuck, I'll ask. still there, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, he's like number three in the company. But yeah, oh, working with Oakley is just these brands that just meant so much as like childhood, whether it's like Oakley or Nike or like Foot Locker. Like now I'm talking with Foot Locker about doing something yeah. like they just these are seminal brands that just meant so much to my childhood that it's did they dope. get it? Did uh, Oakley at that time? Did they get it when you just started working with them? So here's the thing you got to realize when you collaborate with a company, any company, you're not actually collaborating with the whole company. Yeah, you're collaborating very likely with like three people that yeah. understand, yeah, 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 and yeah. it's their do- job to drive your yes. message in, right? So if those three people leave, you're, you tend to be fucked. You know, yeah. it's not like they took a survey and like all twenty five thousand employees agree to this collaboration. It's it's the same. It's the same thing I tell people with seating. Uh-huh. You know, they're like, oh, Jordan Brand don't fuck with me. I'm like, bro, the person <laughs> who gets who is in the yeah, mail room when, don't yeah, fuck yeah, with yeah. you. When, you know what I mean? It's like they don't know. Who to, you know like like if you have a connect that's there. And yeah, then, you know, it's maybe one you go connect. to Vans. Now you're starting to get Vans and say goodbye to Jordans. I love it that, when you say, when, yeah, I hear so many people, yo, Nike yeah. don't fuck yeah, with yeah, me. Like, yeah. trust me, Nike don't know who the fuck you yeah, are. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. You know, it's, it's, 
Okay, well, let me tell you a story. So, yeah. you know, Nike has different regions, right? Like Nike Europe. So I wanted this shoe that came out from a from a European designer. Mm -hmm. And I asked my friend at Nike EU to be like, can, can you hook me up with a pair of these? I never asked, but this is hard to get. And she's like, I got you. She's like, I'm going to send them to the New York City office, and then they'll get them to you, right? She sends them to the New York City office. I'm like, I never got them. She's like, what the fuck? So then she's like, I'm going to send another pair. She sends another pair. It comes to me, but inside the box is a different fucking shoe. Fuck. So she's like, yo, someone there hates you. Like, someone there is player hating on you. And so it's like, yeah, I could say, like, yo, Nike don't fuck with me. No, the dude in the mailroom don't sure, fuck sure, with me. Sure, or whoever sure, packaged it, you know? Sure. Or, someone, <laughs> I, or, or someone, you know, look, if, if you don't get hate, then... Uh, you know, You're doing something wrong. Exactly. Yeah. You know, exactly. it's like it doesn't. You're never gonna make. Actually, speaking of that, looking back, what do you want your you know legacy to be remembered and staple designs to be remembered by? Like, what do you want? What do you want? What do you want people to remember you by? I want, honestly, a kid to be like, I was going in this direction. I met you. I learned about what you did, and I went in a whole different direction and created a whole new life. Mm -hmm. That to me is the most satisfaction. We talked about kids earlier, like, I don't have kids. Yeah. And we talked about sacrifice. So me and my wife made the sacrifice that we're going to have this life that we live now. And instead of having our own two kids, we have 200,000 kids in the world you sure, know, that, sure. like, are somewhat our and responsibility. Pigeons. And pigeons. <laughs> and birds, yeah. Is, 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 is your wife couldn't have kids? Or no, you just didn't we, want made a, we yeah. both made a decision, yeah. Like, we're yeah. going to live our lives, and, like, our, our, our learnings and our teachings will be passed on to a larger group sure. versus focused on like individuals. Does she work uh, with you? Uh, yeah, on she, she's a designer as that's well. That's cool. That's yep. cool. Now you went to you went to NYU right? first as, as a what a graphic designer? No, or? journalism. Okay, R really? Yeah. Fuck. Okay, yep. so and you, that's how I got. So you made your way to the mic. That, yeah. <laughs> the, the backside. You yeah, know, yeah. I went through the back door, but that's how I was uh, at Fader Magazine. Yes. I was a designer, so I was designing Fader. But I told Rob Stone and John Cohen that, like, yo, I could write, too. And so I was starting to write articles. And one of the first articles I wrote was an article about Nike. And mm. that's, that's how I met Nike as a journalist. Mm. And then when I met Nike as a journalist, he was like, the dude I interviewed, Marcus, he's like, so wait, you got a streetwear line, you're a sneakers connoisseur, and you're a designer? We need to get you out to Beaverton. Mm. That was what he said. And that was my first trip out to Beaverton, Oregon. And 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 the cafeteria there is crazy, <laughs> among other things. Oh, oh yeah, the employee oh, yeah. store. Yeah, no, but going out there is like I said, it was like the Wizard of Oz. So people could catch Jeff Staple at Extra Butter, right? Yeah, uh, that's in downtown, right? Yep. You could, where, I mean, where I'm really there, but it's in Lower East Side on Orchard Street. Yep. One of the dopest sneaker fashion stores in New York. Um, also, uh, a business of hype, right? Yes, my uh, podcast. Which is hype, hype, it's, it's, it's through hypes, right? It's, it's through hypes radio. Yep. Yeah. Hypes radio. Subscribe to it. Check it out. There's a lot of uh, uh, um, inspiring stories from different people uh, uh, from different walks of life, especially in the sneaker game. Yes, you know, especially yep. in the sneaker game. Uh, what else? What else is uh, on deck? Follow me on Instagram to get the latest. Man. Jeff Stay for, at, for at a Jeff couple Stay of for. rants about uh, something <laughs> about corporations some, or corporation. whatever, and then he'll sit down with them. Yeah, uh, you know. But I still really get live on Twitter. Really, I love Twitter. Yeah, I still fuck with Twitter. <laughs> I still fuck. With I get Twitter. I get like overwhelmed by Instagram sometimes. I get like bored of it, and then I I'm like deep into Twitter. Is there any brands that uh, you know? Well, Nike obviously you have a long lasting relationship. Mm -hmm. Adidas too. Adidas, we have a great relationship with. So I just helped them launch Futurecraft Loop, the first 100% okay, yep, recyclable yep. shoe. They asked me to host and MC that entire event. Um, they're doing a design contest that uh, I can't speak a lot about, but like they want yeah. me to be a part of that. So it's great. I mean, it, it. One of the dopest things is that both brands are able to see what I contribute as not like competitive. Yeah. You know, they know that I'm not just going for the bag and trying to get it. They. I think I'd like for them to believe that like I'm really about this culture sure. and the money is second. I'm glad the money's there, don't get me wrong, I'm a capitalist at heart, but it's got to be right for the culture first. Sure. I mean, you've been around a long time to uh, prove that. The only thing I'm going to say, I'm going to leave you on this, uh, did you get a pigeon chain with diamond uh, you got to get like you know Greg Yoon or Mr. Forbes? Ben Baller, like Ben Baller, well, ben where Baller. you at? Yeah. Ben Baller. Uh, <laughs> more so, did you get a pigeon tattoo? You, no, you had to get one. You no. haven't got any tattoos? I have a tattoo. Okay, okay. Yeah. Listen, pigeon tattoo. Yeah, my wedding my wedding ring is tattooed. Really? Look oh, at that. That's pretty dope. Yeah. <laughs> Can't take it off at the strip club. That's pretty dope. How long how long are you? <laughs> <laughs> they don't care anyway in the strip club. <laughs> they actually look for the ring, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, okay, this is the guy I'm going after. <laughs> Yo, uh, uh, how long have you been married? Uh four years. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah. It's 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 beautiful. Yeah. 
It's it, well, it's a partnership. Yep. You know, um, and I wouldn't. You know, for me, it, it'd be easier to know that once you've been divorced and then came back. I wouldn't tell you that, but I, I'm saying no, I've no, been no. Divor- I'm divorced. Know. Oh, really? And my wife is Fuck. divorced. Yo, I'm. Then we are a firm believer that. It should be your second one. The second one is the magic. I one. know it's crazy. And to no say disrespect that, though, but to yeah. the people who mar- who are married right now and happily married. It, I'm happy for you, but you learn shit, and it's like riding a bike. You got to get good at like you got to ride the tricycle first, learn how to do it, and then that might fuck up. And then the second one's gonna be the bomb. Yeah, <laughs> you too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, 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 I'm in it. I'm in the seat. But listen, <laughs> listen, internet. Uh, uh, check Jeff Staple out. If you don't know of him, I hope you uh, uh, are intrigued and inspired. Check him out. If you do know of him, and even if you work with him, anybody listening in the, in, in the sneak industry, anyway, I hope you like you learn some things that you didn't know uh, about Jeff. Good fellow. Listen, you can't be in, one thing. I really appreciate is sneakers have always been fun mm-hmm. for me, just like you. Yeah, and it's like you made a business out of it. Right, it's something to respect, man. Thank you, man. Something Thanks for having me on. All right, brother. Peace. See you soon. Peace. Internet. If you enjoyed that episode, then hit me up. That's right. Email me at the premium peace show at gmail dot com again. That's the premium peach show at gmail.com. If you're an advertiser, any big company, small company, startup, whatever it is, you want to advertise on the premium peach show, hit me up. Email the premium peach show at gmail.com and we'll, we'll get to working. Okay. And if you have a suggestion or you want to hear a certain guest on the show, whatever it is. Okay. You know, you could at premium Pete at premium peach show on Twitter, or Instagram, or for the last time I'll tell you, well, I'm not gonna, it's not the last time. Email me, the premium show at gmail.com, and let's get to working. Cheer. <laughs>